Welcome to another episode of the True Crime Tales. Before we dive into today's show, please smash the subscribe button so you can get notified instantly when our show comes out. Thank you, for you will not want to miss an episode of our true crime stories from around the world that will grab your interest from start to finish. Sit back, relax as Ava will bring you today's episode. Thank you, Eric. Today's episode of the True Crime Tales is the murder of Sandra Rivet. Sandra Rivet was the nanny to Richard John Bingham, or better known as Lord Lucan's three children, and is believed to have been murdered by him after he mistook her for his estranged wife. Did he actually kill her and then vanish? Was this a plot? Born in 1945, Sandra Rivett spent the first decade of her life in Australia before returning to the UK where her family settled in Croydon, South London. Sandra had two children as a single mom. The first was raised by her parents and the second adopted. She would go on to marry Royal Navy seaman Roger Rivett when she was 21. Their seven-year marriage was over by the time she worked for the Lucans. It is believed Sandra Rivet was bludgeoned to death by Lord Lucan in the basement of his Belgravia home. It is thought Lucan could have mistaken the nanny for his estranged wife. The Countess had been granted custody of their three children and filed for divorce before the attack. On November 7, 1974, it's alleged that Lucan went to the family home and attacked Sandra, 29, as she went downstairs to make the Countess a cup of tea. The Countess, then 37, was also attacked and fled to a nearby pub. It was later revealed by Sandra's sister that she would not normally have been working on the night of the attack, but that she had changed her day off. Teresa Hill also said her sister and the Countess were very close and they would even exchange clothes. Lord Lucan vanished after the attack and his disappearance has remained a mystery for more than 40 years. Was this his attempt to escape what he had done or was it that he too is a victim of a plot to ruin him and the family name? Sandra Eleanor Rivet was born on September 16, 1945, the third child of Albert and Eunice Hensby. The family moved to Australia when she was two years old but returned in 1955. Sandra was a popular child, described at school as intelligent, although she does not excel academically. She worked for six months as an apprentice hairdresser before taking a job as a secretary in Croydon. After a failed romance, Sandra became a voluntary patient at a mental hospital near Red Hill, Surrey, where she was treated for depression. She became engaged to a builder named John and took a job as a children's nanny for a doctor in Croydon. On March 13, 1964, she gave birth to a boy named Stephen, but as her relationship with John was failing, she returned home to live with her parents and considered giving the baby up for adoption. Her parents took on the responsibility and adopted him in May 1965. Sandra later worked at a home for the elderly before moving to Portsmouth to stay with her older sister. While there she met Roger Rivet, the two married on June 10, 1967, in Croydon. Roger was serving as a Royal Navy able seaman and later worked as a loader for British Road Services, while Sandra worked part-time at Reedham Orphanage in Pulley. In mid-1973, he took a job on an Esso tanker, returning to their flat in Kenley a few months later, by which time Sandra was employed by a cigarette company in Croydon. Their marriage collapsed in May 1974 when, suspicious of Sandra's movements while he was away, Roger went to live with his parents. She was by then listed in the books of a Belgravia domestic agency and had been caring for an elderly couple in that district. A few weeks later, she began to work for the Lucans. Sandra normally went out with her boyfriend, John Hankins, on Thursday nights, but had changed her night off and had seen him the previous day. The two last spoke on the telephone at about 8 p.m. on November 7th. Lady Lucan later claimed that after putting the younger children to bed, 
At about 8.55 p.m., Sandra asked her if she would like a cup of tea before heading downstairs to the basement kitchen to make one. Wondering what had delayed her nanny when she did not come back, Lady Lucan descended from the first floor and called to rivet from the top of the basement stairs when she was attacked. As she screamed for her life, her attacker told her to shut up. Lady Lucan later claimed at that moment to have recognized her husband's voice. The two continued to fight. She bit his fingers, and when he threw her face down to the carpet, managed to turn around and squeeze his testicles, causing him to release his grip on her throat and give up the fight. When she asked where Rivet was, Lucan was at first evasive, but eventually admitted to having killed her. Terrified, Lady Lucan told him she could help him escape if only he would remain at the house for a few days to allow her injuries to heal. Lucan walked upstairs and sent his daughter to bed, then went into one of the bedrooms. When Veronica entered to lie on the bed, he told her to put towels down first to avoid staining the bedding. Lucan asked her if she had any barbiturates and went to the bathroom to get a wet towel, supposedly to clean Veronica's face. Lady Lucan realized her husband would be unable to hear her from the bathroom and made her escape, running outside to a nearby public house, the Plumber's Arms. Lucan may have arrived at the Chester Square home of Madeleine Florman, mother of one of Francis's school friends, sometime between 10 p.m. and 10.30 p.m. Alone in the house, Florman ignored the door, but shortly afterwards she received an incoherent telephone call and put the receiver down. Bloodstains, which after forensic examination were found to be a mixture of blood groups A and B, were later discovered on her doorstep. Lucan certainly called his mother between 10.30 p.m. and 11 p.m. and asked her to collect the children from Lower Belgrave Street. According to the Dowager Countess, he spoke of a terrible catastrophe at his wife's home. He told her that he had been driving past the house when he saw Veronica fighting with a man in the basement. He had entered the property and found his wife screaming. The location from which Lucan made this call and possibly the call to floor man, remains unknown. The police forced their way into Lady Lucan's home and discovered Rivet's body before his wife was taken by ambulance to St. George's Hospital. Lucan drove the Ford Corsair 42 miles to Uckfield, East Sussex, to visit his friends, the Maxwell Scots. Susan Maxwell Scott's meeting with Lucan was his last confirmed sighting. By the time Detective Chief Superintendent Roy Ranson arrived at Lower Belgrave Street early on November 8th, the divisional surgeon had pronounced Rivet dead, and forensic officers and photographers had been called to the property. Other than the front door, which the first two officers on the scene had kicked in, there was no sign of a forced entry. A bloodstained towel was found in Veronica's first-floor bedroom. The area around the top of the basement staircase was heavily bloodstained. A bloodstained lead pipe lay on the floor. Pictures hanging from the staircase walls were skewed and a metal banister rail was damaged. At the foot of the stairs, two cups and saucers lay in a pool of blood. Rivet's arm protruded from the canvas sack, which lay in a slowly expanding pool of blood. The light fitting at the bottom of the stairs was missing its bulb, one was noted nearby on a chair. Blood was also found on various leaves in the adjoining rear garden. Officers also searched Five Eaton Row, into which Lucan had moved early in 1973, interviewed his mother, whom he had called to take the children to her home in St. John's Wood, and searched his last address at 72A Elizabeth Street. Nothing untoward was found. On the bed, a suit and shirt lay alongside a book on Greek shipping millionaires, and Lucan's wallet, car keys, money, driver's license, handkerchief, and spectacles were on a bedside table. His passport was in a drawer and his blue Mercedes-Benz parked outside, its engine cold and its battery flat. Ranson then visited Lady Lucan at St. George's Hospital. Although heavily sedated, 
she was able to describe what had happened to her. A police officer was left to guard her should her assailant return. Rivet's body was taken to the mortuary, and a search was undertaken of all local basement areas and gardens, skips, and open spaces. After removing her corpse from the canvas sack and beginning the post-mortem examination, pathologist Keith Simpson told Ranson he was certain that Rivet had been killed before her body was placed in the sack, and that in his opinion the lead pipe found at the scene could be the murder weapon. Her estranged husband, Roger, had an alibi for the night concerned and was eliminated from police inquiries. Other male friends and boyfriends were questioned and discounted as suspects. Rivet's parents confirmed that she had a good working relationship with Lady Lucan and was extremely fond of the children. Meanwhile, Lucan had yet to make an appearance, and so his description was circulated to police forces across the country. Newspapers and television stations were told only that Lucan was wanted by the police for questioning. Hours earlier, Lucan had again called his mother at about 12.30 a.m. He told her that he would be in touch later that day, but declined to speak with the police constable who had accompanied her to her flat. Instead, he said he would call the police later that morning. Ranson discovered that Lucan had traveled to Uckfield when he was called by Ian Maxwell Scott, who told him that Lucan had arrived at his home a few hours after the murder and spoken with his wife, Susan. While there, the Earl had written two letters to his brother-in-law, Bill Shandkid, and posted them to his London address. Maxwell Scott also called Shand Kidd at his country house near Leighton Buzzard and told him about the letters, prompting the latter to immediately drive to London to collect them. After reading them and noting that they were blood-stained, he took them to Ranson. When asked why she did not immediately inform the police of Lucan's presence, Susan said she had not seen any newspapers or television news or listened to any radio broadcasts that might have warned her of the importance of his visit. Meanwhile, Lucan's children were taken by their aunt, Lady Sarah Gibbs, to her home in Gillsboro, Northamptonshire, where they would remain for several weeks. On the day Lady Lucan was discharged from the hospital, a high court hearing confirmed that the children could return to live with her. Repeated press intrusions later forced the family to move to a friend's home in Plymouth. The Ford Corsair that Lucan had been seen driving and whose details had the previous day been circulated across the country was found on November 10th in Norman Road, New Haven, about 16 miles from Uckfield. In its trunk was a piece of lead pipe covered in surgical tape and a full bottle of vodka. The car was removed for forensic examination. Later statements from two witnesses suggest that it was parked there sometime between 5 a.m. and 8 a.m. on the morning of November 8th. Its owner, Michael Stoop, also received a letter from Lucan delivered to his club, the St. James's. However, Stoop threw the envelope away, and it was therefore not possible to check its postmark to see from where it had been sent. Ranson suspected suicide, but a thorough search of New Haven Downs was judged impossible. A partial search was made using tracker dogs, but all that was found were the skeletal remains of a judge who had disappeared years earlier. Police divers searched the harbor, and a partial search using infrared photography was undertaken the following year, to no avail. A warrant for Lucan's arrest, to answer charges of murdering Sandra Rivet and attempting to murder his wife, was issued on November 12th. Descriptions of his appearance, already issued to police forces across the UK, were then issued to Interpol. The scientific examination of the lead pipes found at the murder scene and in the Corsair's trunk revealed traces of blood on the pipe from 46, Lower Belgrave Street. This proved to be a mixture of Lady Lucan's Blood Group A and Rivet's Blood Group B. Hair belonging to Lady Lucan was also found on that pipe, but none belonging to Rivet. The pipe found inside the Corsair had neither blood nor hair on it. 
Home office scientists were unable to prove conclusively that both pipes were cut from the same, longer, piece of piping, although they thought it was likely. The tape wrapped around both was similar, but those two could not be conclusively linked. The letters written to Kidd were stained with blood considered to be from both women. The letter to Stoop had no blood on it, but it was later proven that the paper it was written on had been torn from a writing pad found in the Corsair's trunk. An examination of the blood stains found inside 46, Lower Belgrave Street demonstrated that Rivet had been attacked in the basement kitchen, while Lady Lucan had been attacked at the top of the basement stairs. The blood stains found inside the Corsair were of the AB blood group. The report concluded that this might have been a mixture of blood from both women. Hair similar to Lady Lucan's was also found inside the car. The inquest into Sandra Rivet's death opened on November 13, 1974, and was led by the coroner for Inner West London, Gavin Thurston. Two witnesses were called to the courtroom, which was packed with reporters. Roger Rivet, who confirmed that he had identified his wife's body, and the pathologist Keith Simpson, who confirmed that Rivet had died from being hit on the head with a blunt instrument. At Ranson's request, the hearing was then adjourned. Further adjournments were made on December 11, 1974 and March 10, 1975, before a full inquest was scheduled for June 16, 1975. The hearing began with introductions from various legal representatives, including a lawyer hired for Lucan by his mother. Thurston introduced the jury to the case and explained their duties. He had selected 33 witnesses to be called over the following few days, including Lady Lucan, who each day wore a dark coat and white headscarf. Thurston questioned her on her relationship with Lucan, her marriage, her financial affairs, her employment of Rivet, and what had happened on the night of the attack. The Dowager Countess's Queen's Council attempted to ask Lady Lucan about the nature of their relationship or if she hated her husband, but Thurston ruled his line of questioning inadmissible. Woman Detective Constable Sally Blower, who had taken a statement from Lady Frances Lucan on November 20, 1974, read the young girl's words to the court. Frances had heard a scream and a few minutes later had watched as her mother, with blood on her face, and father had entered the room. Her mother had then sent her to bed. She later heard her father calling for her mother, asking where she was, and watched as he left the bathroom and walked downstairs. She also described how Rivet did not normally work on Thursday nights. The landlord of the Plumber's Arms pub described how Lady Lucan had entered his bar covered, head to toe in blood, before she fell into a state of shock. He claimed that she shouted, Help me, help me, I've just escaped from being murdered, and also yelling, My children, my children, he's murdered my nanny. Simpson outlined his post-mortem examination, concluding that death was caused by blunt head injuries, and inhalation of blood. He confirmed that the lead pipe found at the scene was most likely responsible for Rivet's injuries, some to the left eye and mouth he thought more likely to have been caused by punches from a clenched fist. The last person to confirm seeing Lucan alive, Susan Maxwell Scott, told the court that the Earl looked disheveled and his hair a little ruffled. His trousers had a damp patch on the right hip. Lucan had told her that he was walking or passing by the lower Belgrave Street residence when he saw Veronica being attacked by a man. He let himself in but slipped into a pool of blood at the bottom of the stairs. He told Maxwell Scott that the attacker ran off and that Veronica was very hysterical and accused him of having hired a hitman to kill her. I will record that Sandra Eleanor Rivet died from head injuries, that at 10.30 p.m. on November 7, 1974, she was found dead at 46, Lower Belgrave Street, and that the following offense was committed by Richard John Bingham, Earl of Lucan, 
namely the offense of murder. Once the hearing had ended, Thurston made a summary of the evidence presented and told the jury their options. At 11.45 a.m., their foreman announced murder by Lord Lucan. Lucan became the first member of the House of Lords to be named a murderer since 1760 when Lawrence Shirley, 4th Earl Ferrers, was hanged for killing his bailiff. He was also the last person to be committed by a coroner to the Crown Court for unlawful killing. The coroner's power to do so was removed by the Criminal Law Act of 1977. Rivet's body, which had been held for several weeks following the murder, was released to her family and cremated at Croydon Crematorium on December 18, 1974. A police spokesman cited Lady Lucan's desire not to upset the family as a reason for her non-attendance at the cremation. In 1974, Britain, and later much of the rest of the world, was captivated by the brutal murder and the rapid disappearance of the main suspect, an aristocrat named Richard John Bingham, or Lord Lucan. It helped that Lucan was a dashing British aristocrat and army officer, known for his prowess at backgammon and bridge, and his fondness for vodka martinis, powerboats, and Aston Martin cars. It helped, too, that the murder took place in an apartment's dark basement, providing space for conjecture. What helped the most, though, was that Lucan disappeared forever, meaning no one could say for sure what happened. There have been many theories, some of which are that he committed suicide by stuffing rocks in his pants after he realized his mistake and threw himself off a ferry into its propeller so that no one would find his body, or he started a new life in Africa, where he was fed to a tiger. Other reports of him have also popped up in Australia, Ireland, and New Zealand. No one knows for sure. By 2017, he had been spotted more than 70 times, but none of the sightings proved to be true. To this day, the public doesn't know what happened to Lucan. His big win had earned him the nickname, Lucky, but money was a problem. His luck didn't last, and by the time of the murder, he owed about $60,000. By 1972, Lucan had moved out, but he was worried he would lose access to his children. Things escalated in the weeks before the murder when Veronica won a court battle for custody. The battle had been bitter, and according to the Times, his efforts to prove she was insane had pushed him further into debt. On the night Rivet was murdered, Lucan never showed up to a date he'd arranged with a woman named Andrina Calhoun. Instead, he went to the family home at 46 Lower Belgrave Street. Veronica maintained Lucan had meant to kill her and accidentally killed Rivet in the dark. In the few hours before he disappeared, Lucan maintained someone else had tried to kill his wife. After all, it is foolish to spend time debating who killed Sandra Rivets or how she was murdered. It is clear, based on both physical evidence and the testimony of Lady Lucan, that her husband is the prime and only suspect. Also, that Lord Lucan ran away after the assault and homicide to flee from capture and avoid punishment for his crimes. He had a motive he was scared to death of losing the little custody he had left of his children. He was bitter about his wife's legal battles and his declining mental health and enraged over the continued gambling addiction. Lucan first worked as a banker, but after he won ten times his salary in an evening of Baccarat, he became a professional gambler. Seeking justice in this case is not a useless endeavor while many have accepted that John Bingham is likely dead either by suicide or other causes. Even if he is old, he could still be alive. A man of Lucan's former wealth and power would have the connections to make sure they had the best health care available no matter where he ended up. He would be 88 in the present day, and despite the years since the murder, no man is too old to face justice and answer for their crimes. A new twist in the disappearance of Lord Lucan has emerged as a facial recognition expert believes he has matched his face to an elderly man in Australia. 
Professor Hassan Yugel, who previously identified the Russian hitmen behind the Salisbury poisonings, believes his algorithm is never wrong. The computer scientist used the AI algorithm to run 4,000 cross-checks of seven photos, four of Lucan and three of the man in Australia. And he is convinced it is a match for Lucan, who killed his family's nanny and then disappeared in 1974. It comes 48 years to the day that he murdered Sandra Rivet before disappearing, with many believing he jumped off a ferry in the channel. His body was never found. The man, who lives outside Brisbane in Queensland, was found by Ms. Rivet's son, Neil Berriman. He is 87, the same age as Lucan, whose real name John Bingham would be. However, these claims have not been verified, and it is unclear if police could even act on the photo analysis. I've spent nine years trying to prove this man is Lucan. Now, with this new scientific information, the police must act. This is an emotion. It's fact. Professor Ugal said, In recent years there has been a massive improvement in artificial intelligence and facial recognition technology. We can now confirm things that would have been impossible just five years ago. We've compared thousands and thousands of people, and there have been literally millions of photos that we've analyzed using the algorithm. It has never been wrong. This algorithm has been trained on millions of photos. People of different ethnicities, different ages. The only time it will fail is if you put in identical twins. It only takes a few minutes to run it, and it comes back with a percentage, a similarity index. Even if you put two exact images of the same person, you are never going to get 100% similarity because of the way images are taken, pixels, and everything else. Anything with a similarity index of 75% or higher is conclusively the same individual. Professor Ugal had previously found the two men behind the Salisbury poisonings were Alexander Mishkin and Denis Sergeyev, with the two having adopted aliases during their mission to kill Russian defector Sergei Skripal in 2018. All these analyses to his facial recognition were wrong. A new set of comparisons were run, and it was determined that the older man they thought was John Bingham was in fact not him. The hunt continues for Lucan, or evidence of where he is. Thank you Ava for another interesting show, as always. Thanks for joining us and hope that you enjoyed our latest podcast. Please follow us on the links in our channel page. And leave a review, and again if you did not do already, hit that subscribe button. Thanks again and see you here next time.